Hi, so my name is Diego Garcia, um, and today we'll be having our second lecture on group theory with some physics this time, because what's the point of doing this math if we can't have some applications, right? I mean, the math is fun regardless, but application, people care about applications, so we'll go into that this time. And so we'll cover a little bit of application, not, not a lot, just a little bit, enough for this small lecture. And so the order of today's lecture will be some additional group theory. And then after that, you're going to what an extension of group theory called representation theory, which you'll understand the name when we get to it. Very simple. Uh, well, the topic isn't simple, but the name, like the reason why it's called that simple, right? And then after that, we'll get to quantum and how you've probably used representation theory without realizing it was representation theory. So, let's start. So we'll start with this, right? This new topic um, from group theory called a group action. And so what a group action is, is elements of a group acting on a set. And you can also call it, you can also define it as a, a mapping of from set X to itself by elements of the group, right? And so we have here the cyclic group. Oh, we'll go through an example real quick before we um, further explore this topic. So the, we have the cyclic group two, right? And so also called the binary group, which hopefully you remember from last time, but I'll recover it real quickly. And so the elements are the identity and A. So identity acting on A is equal to the A acting on the identity is equal to A. Simple. And then you have the identity acting on self is the identity and then you also have a acting on itself which gives you the identity because a is equal to its inverse so that's the relatively simple group right and this set x consists of an ordered pair and so it consists of all the possible permutations of the ordered pairs and so this is generally a group that we study, um, um, like how operators act on it. And so here's a simple one, right? So we have A, B, and then B and A. And so the group action of C2 acting on X can be ran down right here, right? We have identity acting on the first element, A acting on the first element, and then any act second element, ident or A acted on the second element. And so then um, I'll give you a little bit of time to think about what do you think would happen, right, if, we're, if we have this. Not too much time. Okay, that should, that should hopefully be enough. And so, of course, as it sounds like, the identity sends the elements to themselves, right? And then A, well, there's only one other possibility. And so if you want to think about it as an action, right, the fact that A is its own inverse forces it to be that if you apply A twice, that it sends it back, it sends the element back to itself in this set, right? And so what that means is A has to swap the order of the pair, because if you swap it, and then you swap, you apply it again, you swap it back, and that's the, what it originally was. Then we're going to continue on to as the S3 group. This is also known as the symmetric 3 group. And so there's six elements in it. There's identity, and we have alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. And so it might look intimidating at first, but I'll walk you through it, right? So alpha, or the, sorry, the identity sends each point to itself, of course. And alpha 1 is rotating it counterclockwise 120 degrees. And so this is why it's called the symmetry group three, because we have three points and we're looking at the symmetries of this two-dimensional object, right? We have this, and then same thing here. Rotate it clockwise on 20. And on the right side of this, we have the flipping across the axes. So this one we're flipping against uh, the axis that's lined with A. 
and then you continue with that so that you flip B and A, and this one, you flip A and C. So, now we have those right. I will also note that if you notice, so this is alpha 1, right? Alpha 2 is alpha 1 inverse. It's also equal to alpha 1 squared. And then, in fact, you'll see that B2 can be written as a product of alpha 1 and then applying beta 1. B3 be written as alpha 1 squared beta 1. And so, in fact, for this group, we call those the generators of the group. And so we have this is the group generated by alpha, and this is the group generated by beta. And so then this is saying that the symmetric four group, or sorry, that's symmetric, that should be symmetric three. This is saying that the symmetric three group is uh, what we call the direct product, which is basically multiplying all of the elements in the two groups, and then you have the new group, right? I'll also note that we notice these. Think about it in terms of a plane, right? We can look at this in R squared, and then you can have a matrix that rotates it, right? Because we have rotation matrices in R squared, in the vector space R squared. And so, the fact that we can even talk about it like that, right? Oh, let me go back real quick. So this is equivalent to the same thing we did up here, but instead of um, instead of x, where this is x, we have a, b, c, and they have all the permutations of that. And then in terms of the group that's acting on it, that's just the S3 group, right? And so the S3 group consists of the transformations of those elements to each other. And so then, what representation theory is, basically writing one group or vector space in multiple forms, right? And so we have this little handy definition down here, which would be the, the brackets denotes that this is, or representate, we're representing the group, and then the little um, character on the bottom right of the bracket tells you what set it's acting on. Because we could have each group, we could define each group however we want. We could call the elements bananas and apples for all we care. But what matters is how does it act on other sets, right? So this one would be group G acting on set X. We're going to turn it into representation of group through G acting on set Y. And then there's a transformation of X from set X to set Y. And so then the formal definition would be that the representation of group uh, of group G acting on X is iso so this is called isomorphic. To group G acting on Y, acting on Y, right? And so it's basically it, it's it, that's the formal definition. So isomorphism means that if you apply the group to the set, all the elements maintain their still like relationships of the operator, like them operating with each other and that sort of thing. And so, like I mentioned before, I mentioned R2, right? So we are going to write the matrices, matrix representations of those um, operators I mentioned before, right, of the elements of S4. So these are the generators of, well, these two are the generators of S4. That's just the identity, which um, hopefully you guys can figure out yourselves and think about it if you think about it for a second, right? I gave you some handy, or not handy, I chose the um, 
alpha one and beta one specifically, so it'd be relatively easy to get the generators right. And so, as we mentioned here, here's a rotation matrix. These are rotations, so we can just plug in 120 degrees into that to get that alpha one should be negative, oh yeah, hold on. negative one half in front times one red three, negative one and one. Beta, let's just call this beta one and alpha one. Beta equal to negative one, zero, zero, one, because it's reflecting the X, right? And then the identity is, of course, the identity. So now we're gonna get to the quantum part. And so, Specifically, we'll talk about some spin and momentum stuff, right? So we have the Hamiltonian, and then we have the momentum operator, right? And so these commute. And LZ, or sorry, else the momentum um, operator squared commutes with the Z component of the momentum operator, right? Those also commute. So it's convenient to, well, we'll get to that in a second. So let's commute. So we want to be able to write um, the, sometimes we want to be able to write this, the state in terms of the eigenvectors or L squared and LZ squared. LZ squared is the is the standard one, right? So LZ So LZ is equal to momentum operator for x times y minus the x operator times the momentum operator for y. And so the way these act on the eigenvectors is we get L, L plus 1 h bar squared times the eigenvector, of course, because the eigenvector. And LZ acting on it gives you M h bar. And so the actual eigenvectors corresponding to those um, eigen, what is it called? Not eigenvectors, the, basically culture system, I forget. I'm, for, I'm blanking on what it's called at the moment, um, is what we call spherical harmonics, which hopefully, well, not hopefully, you don't have to have covered it what we call spherical harmonics. If you don't know what it is, you can always look it up after the lecture, but it's not important because the L's and the M's are elements of either the integers, which we define as Z, or the integers plus one half. So, M is bounded by L. Sorry. So the absolute value of M is bounded by L. Right. And so it's convenient to write it, write the eigenvectors in terms of L and M. And that would be a representation because all those eigenvectors are orthogonal and then you have a basis, a set of basis vectors which has two L plus one elements, which means 
that the LZ operator and all the other operators can be written out in terms of matrices. And there's your representation theory. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that um, goes into quantum mechanics that you can study in terms of abstract algebra and its extensions. That's all we'll cover for today. I hope you enjoyed it.